As many of you know, on October 15th, CASA will be hosting an SEL Exchange Virtual Summit, a four-hour virtual experience for any and all who are dedicated to catalyzing and supporting our commitment to young people. During the event, you'll hear from diverse voices, including young people, researchers, educational leaders, community partners, and many more. As we come together to understand dimensions of individual and societal healing and transform transformation through SEL, anchored by an unwavering commitment to equity. Registration for the event is going to open on September 14th, so if you haven't already done so, um, I recommend that you sign up to be alerted for when registration opens, and we're going to put a link in the chat right now um, for where you can go to sign up and also learn more about the SEL Exchange. Uh, I'd like to thank the many sponsors who are supporting the virtual summit, including our generous presenter sponsor, Maui Learning, who's joining us today to bring you this sponsored webinar. If you don't know about Maui Learning, it's part of ACT's SEL portfolio and was selected for inclusion in CASEL's 2019 Effective Social and Emotional Learning Programs Guide. Maui Learning empowers educators to drive academic growth and student well-being through the application of social-emotional learning. The comprehensive solution includes professional development, student curriculum, and assessment. The CASEL aligned and research-based Maui Learning digital courses transform abstract SEL concepts into tangible, grade appropriate mental models, tools, and frameworks that accurately map to ACT's SEL assessment tool, Tessera. You can learn more about Maui Learning and I encourage you to explore the solution and we're gonna put a link into the chat right now uh, for mauilearning.com. All right, I think we are ready to meet our panelists and get started with today's program. We're joined today by Felicia Ryerson. Felicia is a curriculum resource teacher with John Young Elementary School, part of the Orange County Public School System. And Felicia has over 25 years of experience in leadership, classroom instruction, online education, and professional development. Dr. Jeremy Bur Burris is also with us. Jeremy is the Senior Director of ACT's Center for Social, Emotional, and Academic Learning, and his educational background focuses on social psychology. And we're pleased to have Dr. Jill McVeigh with us as well. Jill McVeigh is a research scientist in ACT's Center for Social, Emotional, and Academic Learning. Her primary research interests are in education, particularly the impact that social and emotional skills have on academic achievement. So we are pleased to have um, everyone here with us. Um, and I think we're gonna get started with Jeremy. And Jeremy, you're muted, it looks like. Sorry about that. So, Great, we hear you now. <laughs> okay. So today we'll start off uh, talking about some COVID-related disruptions or where we uh, ended up school last year. Before we get into how we can build a positive school climate, no matter how you come back to school. And then finally, we'll also talk about incorporating uh, social emotional learning, no matter where the classroom is. So before we start, you may be wondering, since when does ACT, ACT focus on SEL? So you're probably more familiar uh, with the ACT in the context of the ACT college admissions test. Over the past few years, ACT has transitioned to take a more holistic view of the student, and this transition has been backed by our holistic framework, uh, a research-based uh, framework that offers a more descript comprehensive description of the knowledge and skills individuals need to know to be able to uh, succeed in education and work settings. And it includes four uh, broad domains, core academic skills, cross-cutting capabilities, behavioral or SEL skills, and education and career navigation. So we'll talk about each of these important issues today when we talk about uh, social emotional learning best practices that can be incorporated uh, as students go back to school this fall. But first, we'll briefly cover where we left off the 2020 school year. We left off the 2020 school year in the throes of, of a pandemic that left, left us with a series of disruptions, uh, which included not only school disruptions, but psychological disruptions as well. For school disruptions, by the beginning of May, there were 177 countrywide school closures, affecting over 1.2 billion learners across the world. Today, there's still over a billion learners around the world affected by, by school closings. So perhaps just as important, however, are the psychological disruptions we've experienced as the result of the pandemic. 
Uh, most of you are probably aware of Maslow's theory, uh, which states that we have a series of needs that are ordered hierarchically. At the top of the hierarchy are self-fulfillment needs, such as self-actualization. Uh, this is where learning can occur. Notice, however, that we can't really get to learning unless we also uh, fulfill the needs that are at the lower level. Now, these include psychological needs, such as esteem and belonging, and basic needs, such as safety and physiological needs. Uh, each of these needs has been disrupted by the pandemic. So let's take a look at uh, basic needs, such as safety and food and shelter first. Uh, a survey of 13,000 high school students conducted by ACT last April asked students to indicate uh, whether they needed basic needs such as shelter, internet, access, uh, or meals. And the results ind indicated that a high percentage of students indicated some need, with underserved learners uh, indicating the most needs. In addition, we conducted a survey of uh, 642 high school students in April. And in that survey, we found that 70% of students uh, had some kind of trouble sleeping at night, and about 23% of them indicated that they were having trouble uh, sleeping near, nearly every single day of the week. So clearly, many students have had trouble meeting their basic needs during the pandemic. Uh, let's turn now to psychological need disruption. In that same survey of 642 high school students uh, that we did in April, we also asked students about the amount of anxiety and the amount of worry that they were feeling. And we found that students were scoring significantly higher than average on the amount of anxiety they were currently feeling. And students were also exhibiting a significant amount of worry. So for example, 65% uh, of students uh, indicated at least some amount of worry that school closures would hurt their chances of getting into college. 78% uh, indicated that they were at least somewhat worried about how the COVID-19 pandemic would impact their life. And a full 91% were worried about how COVID-19 would impact others' lives. We're also feeling psychological disruptions in the form of social isolation. And research has shown that long-term isolation has been linked to higher levels of stress, uh, lower levels of educational attainment, and worse, physical health. So if we return to Maslow's hierarchy, we can see that there's still a gap from basic needs to learning. Even if your basic needs are met, there's still a gap uh, if psychological needs are not met. And we feel that SEL can serve as a bridge, uh, as a bridge for that gap. And we also have some recent evidence from our our research that suggests that strong castle aligned social emotional skills can help. So for example, in our study of high school students from April, we found that the ability to maintain composure was related to sleep. So specifically, the bar on the right represents students that were high in the highest quartile of maintaining composure. And these students have indicated having trouble sleeping only one to two nights per week, as compared to students who were in the lowest quartile who indicated that they were having trouble sleeping three to five nights a week. Uh, students with higher and social emotional skills were also more likely to maintain social connection. So here you can see that students in the higher quartiles of social connection and getting along with others were more likely to initiate phone calls or video calls with friends uh, and loved ones during the pandemic. And then finally, students with higher social emotional skills like sustaining effort and maintaining composure were more likely to engage in positive coping behaviors, uh, such as um, engaging in exercise, uh, meditation or practicing gratitude and encouraging others to stay positive. So as we go back to school this fall, it'll be important to consider social emotional learning, whether school is completely online, in person or a hybrid model of the two. Specifically, for the remainder of the presentation, we'll answer the questions, what can we do to build a positive school culture and climate, and how can we incorporate SEL into these models? So from there, I'll turn it over to Jill McVeigh, who will talk about building a positive school culture and climate, uh, no matter how you come back to school. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, as he said, my name is Jill McVeigh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, ways that you can help build a positive climate uh, in your school or classroom. Um, so what is school climate? 
School climate is generally used to describe the way that a school feels to students and staff, um, and in, it includes these specific elements. So emotional and physical safety, positive relationships between teachers and students, as well as between the students themselves, respect and inclusivity, as well as student and educator engagement. Next slide. So why is school climate important? We know that it's important because numerous re research studies have shown that a positive school climate is associated with a number of really important student outcomes. So schools that are higher in school, um, school climate, more positive, are associated with students who have better levels of psychological well-being, um, they have increased self-esteem, and there's also decreased absenteeism. And this includes chronically absent students. Positive school climates are also associated with lower rates of student substance use and lower rates of aggressive student behavior and suspension. So it's pretty important. Next slide, please. So these are the elements of a positive school and classroom climate that I'm going to discuss today. Um, and it includes safety, relationships, inclusion and respect for all students, regardless of background or ability, and then an emphasis on student engagement, which includes involvement and student autonomy. So safety is a really big piece of school climate, um, and you can think about how it may be particularly important um, today. So one way that is relatively simple that you can help create a foundation for safety in your classroom is simply by providing predictable routines. So display class schedules, um, include visualizations for you know, any student work may be necessary. But if you think about students who may not have a predictable environment outside of school, you can understand why it could be really important um, that they know what to expect when they get to school. Let students know when anything out of the ordinary will occur um, and let them know in advance. So you might say, we're going to have a visitor in the classroom tomorrow or um, we're going to have an assembly at the end of the week. Just to let kids know so they're not um, taken by surprise. Create a welcoming environment in your classroom um, that goes beyond just being welcoming to your students, which is obviously important. Um, but think about things that you have on the walls, um, what kind of books you have, your curricular materials. Is it a space where all kids can be seen? So are there examples of people who look like them, who share their cultural backgrounds? Um, can they really feel valued in your classroom with what you have in your environment. And then finally, the last piece is important all on its own. Um, but building positive relationships is also important for safety. Um, think about students having a trusted adult in their lives um, and how important that is to helping them feel safe. So I may uh, repeat myself a little bit in this presentation, but really all of these areas are interconnected. And so positive relationships are also important for safety. Next slide, please. Specifically related to um, feeling safe when we have the unique environment um, we do now where there is COVID-19, um, there are some things you can do to help students cope a little bit more. So one important thing is being able to listen actively to your students and validate their feelings or concerns. Obviously, we can't solve everyone's problems as much as we might want to, but lending an ear can help them sort out some of their feelings and just provide that sense of safety that they really have an adult who understands. Be aware of the fact that there may be, and probably will be, um, increased anxiety among both students and staff at your school. Having strategies ready to share or use yourself um, can be really helpful to help students uh, cope with those feelings when they're needed. So even something as simple as taking a deep breath, letting it out, can really help to um, calm you down and it's something you can lead your students through as well. And then stay connected with the mental health team at your school or district. Um, there may be times where students have feelings that a strategy cannot help, and it's really important to know who to reach out to and where to get those resources. So next slide, please. Um, specifically related to in-person or hybrid learning, um, obviously the physical environment is going to look a bit different this year. So make sure to regularly communicate any changes that are made to the school environment and emphasize that it's done 
um, to help keep everyone safe. So everyone's doing their part to ensure that everyone stays safe um, by wearing masks or you know, staying away from their friends a little bit. And if you're working with older students, you could include a discussion about risk reduction or mitigation versus absolute safety. Since obviously, you know, 100% safety is, is not possible in any circumstance. Um, and then create and normalize structures and routines related to safety so they become second nature and not something, something that's scary or, um, you know, different, right? So an example might be just having students sanitize their hands as soon as they walk into the classroom and they'll begin to do it without thinking about it. Next slide. Building positive relationships is a piece that's obviously very important and most teachers know this already. Um, but this not only includes teacher-student relationships, but also positive peer relationships. One way to help establish those positive peer relationships is to establish norms for student behavior in your classroom. So we'll talk a little bit about this on some of the next slides. Get to know students individually to help facilitate that relationship, and if at all possible, provide one-on-one -on -one time with them. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, build in time to your schedule to talk about things that are not necessarily school related. So you may have a daily meeting or a weekly time where students can check in with one another and talk to you. Um, this can be as formal or informal as you want to make it. You could provide prompts or just um, let conversation happen or talk about how students feel. And really, this is going to help you build those peer relationships and help them to know one another as well as to know you. So next slide, please. So regardless of where you come back to school or how you come back to school, um, the new school year always starts with introductions and um, fun icebreaker activities. So continue these, um, they can be done in any environment. But one idea is to also create something tangible in the event that you, know, you start in person, you need to go to online or you're all already online. Creating a video or a handout um, with information about yourself, right, your hobbies, what you like to do over the summer, just to help your students get to know you. And then having them create the same thing for themselves um, can provide something they can go back to and um, maybe allow them to interact a little bit more online by responding to these kinds of things and seeing what they have in common with one another. Also, work as a community um, within your classroom to establish norms for both in-person and online interactions, right? So you probably will have some guidelines already as to what you want students to be able to do. Um, you want them to be able to treat each other with respect. Um, but the specific behaviors may be a little bit different depending on the environment. So for example, in, in school, um, it might mean listening when students are talking. And on Zoom, it might mean um, you know, muting yourself <laughs> when someone else is talking. So uh, make sure you outline specific behaviors you want to see and those you don't want to see and encourage uh, your, your class members to come up with their own examples so they feel involved in the process. Next slide, please. Specific to hybrid and online teaching, um, make sure you have a method used to check in with students one-on-one -on -one periodically, um, knowing what way they um, like to communicate best is important not only for you know, staying in contact and um, facilitating that relationship, but also just in the event of any absences or things like that, you, you wanna know how to reach out to kids. And then have a spot in your online materials just for um, you and students to socialize with one another. So for example, if you have a discussion board, um, you can have a show and tell thread. Students could share links, pictures, videos, just make sure you have guidelines about what they can share and it could be a really fun space for them. Next slide, please. Inclusion and respect is another um, pillar of school and classroom climate. And for this piece, you really wanna build on the safety and relationships to create a community where students feel comfortable sharing their own traditions, cultures, and experiences. In order to create this environment, um, you wanna provide students with opportunities to share their interests and their talents. And you can do this by specifically inviting them to do so. Not only will um, having students' personal experiences allow them to feel more engaged in the learning process, 
but also activating that background knowledge will really allow them to connect more deeply to the content and learn it better, essentially. Next slide. Hold all of your students to high academic standards and make sure that everyone has the opportunity to be successful in your classroom. Holding your students to high standards will have, um, allow them to also have high standards for themselves. And if you're thinking about how you can facilitate this process in the classroom, um, one thing you wanna ask yourself is if you have learning content where students can see themselves recognized, um, someone who looks like them or who has their cultural backgrounds or traditions, and whether or not they can see themselves in a positive way in these materials. And then also ask if your learning environment is accessible for students who have learning differences or disabilities. Um, are you differentiating or individualizing instruction? And is there a universal design process to help make everything accessible for all students? Next slide. Specific to um, in-person hybrid or online, there are some ideas or ways you can help build this into your classroom. So sharing examples of how the topic you're teaching can relate to students or cultures um, is a big one. And then inviting kids to share their own experiences so they can find a way to relate to the content. Offer content that positively represents a range of cultures. Um, so we all know there are certain months of the year that um, are associated with specific, specific groups, but really you want to offer content throughout the year that's really meaningful um, to, to all students. And then if possible, allow students to complete assignments based on their own preferences or learning needs. Um, so for example, as long as standards are being met, you may allow students to respond to something flexibly. If they struggle with writing, for example, they may wanna do a short video response instead of a written one and allowing the students this flexibility, you know, allows them to showcase their talents and build on their strengths. Next slide. The last piece of school climate that I'll talk about is related to student involvement and autonomy. So if you think about um, little kids, there's often a structure for having them involved in the classroom, right? They may be a line leader or take lunch boxes to the cafeteria, but really the structure should be given to students of all ages. So for older students, you might encourage them to take turns teaching one another or um, formally have students take on leadership roles in different projects. So that way they have the space to be involved and then give students choices and opportunities to learn about their own interests. Um, I think we can all relate to this one, right? Something that we're really interested in is going to produce more engagement than something that is just given to us. And then provide channels to allow for student feedback and input. And this is something I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about. So regardless of where you come back to school, um, giving students choice about their work is really powerful. Again, um, there can be a lot of flexibility with this. Depending on what students are learning about, it may be that um, the format allows for them to really take the lead. So if students are learning to write a persuasive essay, you might allow them to pick the topic. And then the last piece here, asking for input and feedback from students about what works best for them can be particularly important in an online setting. Maybe you are spending a lot of time reporting lectures um, so that students you know, have the content, but really they find small group work most useful. So this way you can allow your teaching strategies to align with what students really um, are connecting with and um, gathering that feedback will give you the information you need to hopefully have a smoother year, even though it, it looks different. So now I'm going to hand it off to Felicia Ryerson, and she is going to talk about what her school in Florida has done to incorporate SEL. Thanks, Jill. I'm a curriculum resource teacher at John Young Elementary in Orlando, Florida. About a year and a half ago, we made a commitment to make the social emotional learning of our students a top priority. Using the research and work done by CASEL, the Center for the Collaborative Classroom and Maui Learning, we developed a plan to create a school-wide culture of respect and kindness. We wanted all stakeholders, students, teachers, and parents to feel valued and a part of our school community. We knew from the research that we 
would provide a safe, positive learning environment that would result in academic success for our students. We also wanted our students to acquire mental toughness. We adopted the slogan, life is tough, but so are you, and even had it painted on a wall near the lobby of our school. So how did we get there? Next slide. We built a plan around our goals that Jill, many of which Jill mentioned earlier, the importance of building relationships within the school, not only amongst our students, but thinking about our teachers, our staff, and our parents as well. We wanted to make the teaching of social skills intentional and embedded throughout the day. And finally, we wanted that safe, calm, positive learning environment we all knew was so important to the success of our students. So we began with continuous professional development, using the work of the experts at CASEL, the Center for Collaborative Classrooms, and Maui Learning. In addition, as coaches and school leaders, we made it a priority to begin every PLC with an activity focused on one of the five core competencies of SEL and modeling activities our teachers could use in their classroom. We continue to open every PLC, whether we're face-to-face -face or virtual, with an SEL topic or activity. <clears throat> for each of the goals we adopted, we applied specific strategies for achieving those goals. You could move to the next slide, please. Next slide. Our goals were practiced in the traditional classroom until spring, when everything was forced to shift to distance learning. Little did we know how important that slogan we adopted, life is tough, but so are you, would become six months after first sharing it with staff and students. So we'll discuss some of the strategies that we use for each of our goals, building relationships. Each and every day, the first 10 to 15 minutes of our school day is devoted to morning meetings. This gave students the opportunity to greet one another, preview the day's schedule, share announcements, and participate in a discussion or activity related to their social emotional learning. Closing meetings are also held at the end of every day to reflect on the day. What went well today? What might we do differently tomorrow? And to properly say goodbye to each of our classmates. This continued in the shift to distance learning. I can honestly say that because students enjoyed their class meetings so much in the traditional classroom, they were diligent about coming to school on time. They didn't want to miss their class meetings. Well, the same is true in our distance learning. They logged in on time. They didn't want to miss their morning meeting. So participation and engagement remained very high. In addition, when building relationships, we wanted to give our students choice, choice in selecting some of the activities, how they presented their ideas, and how they selected their partners. We arranged for class buddies across grade levels as a way to build relationships outside of their own classroom, but throughout the school. During distance education, we also invited other classes to join our classrooms virtually so that we could build relationships across the virtual classrooms. And then we had our spotlight for students, where students randomly selected by the teacher to share a presentation about themselves with their classmates. When we moved this to distance learning, it was actually enhanced because students became more creative. Now they were creating PowerPoints or giving us virtual tours of their home or introducing us to their real family pets and their family members instead of just showing us a picture. Next, we'll talk about social skills. They are intentionally taught and modeled throughout the day. It's important to teach children how to greet one another, how to make eye contact, how to know when to properly ask for help, when is the right time, and how do I ask for that help. As part of our face-to-face -face teaching, adults greeted students as they came into the school with the goal of learning to greet as many as possible by their first name. Students also greet one another as they start every class meeting. This happens in the virtual classrooms as well, beginning with a morning greeting. Role playing is an important part of teaching social skills as well. When we shifted to distance education, we continued modeling the proper way to let others know, when are you listening to them? 
how to properly interrupt or ask for that microphone, and how to have appropriate discussions, whether those were verbal discussions or discussions held in a chat or discussion area. Then we'll talk about creating that safe environment. It is created by having clear school-wide expectations, procedures, and rout routines. As Jill mentioned, avoid surprises. We spend a lot of time providing opportunities to practice these routines and procedures. It takes a little extra time on the front end, but the payoff in the end is well worth it. We promote self-discipline. It's a key piece to creating that safe, calm environment. Teachers control their voice levels and tone when correcting students, remembering to treat misbehaviors as an opportunity to learn from making a mistake. We talk about the behavior. We help students to reflect on their behavior and develop their own ideas as to how to handle the situation differently the next time, keeping in mind how their behaviors might impact others. And of course, teaching some calming techniques, those deep breaths, when to walk away, and think before we act. This continued in the online environment as well. Some examples of some online misbehavior might be inappropriate chats, interruptions, lack of participation, all of which can be addressed in a one-on-one -on -one conversation and some problem solving between the instructor and the student. All of the strategies we implemented in the traditional classroom did transition into the online classroom with some thought and creativity. Our goal was to not miss a beat when it came to continuing our vision and those SEL priorities. We wanted to add one more layer. JYE John Young Elementary is a highly diverse school. We have families representing over 45 different countries and provide over and have over 100 ELL students in our school. As we built our SEL vision, we wanted to provide an extra layer of support for those ELL students. That's when we did our research and we found Maui Learning's Super ELL program. This program aligned perfectly with our vision and goals that I just shared with you. So we began teaching in small groups with an ELL facilitator. The Super ELL course allowed our ELL students to build relationships beyond their own classroom, but with other students who may be going through some of the same emotions. We discussed challenges and emotions being experienced when you move to a new country or a new school, or you're trying to learn a new language. They built their own mini support group through the Super ELL program. The Super ELL program gave them opportunities to solve problems together, to develop new vocabulary, and to learn to advocate for themselves. The program was so successful, we had parents calling asking us when could their child be added to one of the small groups. Again, we had to then consider how are we going to move this program into our e-learning classroom? Could switch to the next slide, please. We valued the program and our students, and the students wanted to continue participating with their groups. So we shifted the lessons online through web conferencing, giving choice on how projects might be completed and how they would share those projects with one another. A new benefit of this program being online was now we actually had families participating in our conversations, siblings, parents, even grandparents joined in in our online conversations. In conclusion, we found strategies that were successful in the face-to-face -face classroom that can also be successful in other learning models, whether they be hybrid or completely online with just some minor adjustments. The key was to focus on the goal or the intended outcome and modify lessons and activities to meet the student needs. John Young Elementary continues to keep social emotional learning a priority in both our face-to-face -face and our e-learning classrooms with the goal of creating a school culture focused on respect, kindness, and a safe learning environment. Thank you for letting me share about our school. I'm going to turn it back to Jeremy for our wrap-up. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, we want to end today on an optimistic note that emphasizes the resilience that our students are capable of by highlighting a little bit of the research that we did last spring. So in February of 2020, we measured the social emotional skills of over 3,000 high school students. 
And after the advent of COVID, we resurveyed them a couple of months later um, in April. And specifically, we, re we resurveyed 642 of them. And what we found uh, was pretty interesting and actually surprised us. We found that students actually demonstrated growth in their social emotional skills over these two months. Uh, specifically, they grew in maintaining composure, sustaining effort, getting along with others, uh, keeping an open mind. And interestingly, they developed more maintaining composure and sustaining effort in two months than previous research suggests that they should develop in one to two years. And, this, and we're not really the only ones that are finding this either. Uh, another new study uh, done by a separate group of researchers also found an increase in maintaining composure in adults during the same time period. So if students can develop their social emotional skills under such trying conditions, imagine uh, how they could respond to the experience of a rigorous and systematic social and emotional learning program. So as mentioned previously, ACT has options for, be, for teaching both SEL and academic content in blended and online environments that allow learning to continue whether you're in the classroom, uh, distance learning, or switching in between both. And also we've created a series of free SEL lessons to use during the pandemic that can be accessed via the Maui Learning website listed here. So for some conclusions, uh, as you are aware, the pandemic has disrupted education, but hopefully we've shown that SEL can help. Uh, and it's important to notice and to recognize that basic and psychological needs have to be fulfilled before learning can occur. Uh, as Jill mentioned, we can establish a strong school and classroom culture no matter where school is. And as Felicia mentioned, there's many ways to teach SEL in any environment. And finally, it's, it's important to consider uh, and remember that our students are very resilient. We've seen them grow during the pandemic and they can continue to grow throughout the year. And finally, ACT has options for learning in any environment. And from there, we have plenty of time for questions. There's our emails if you want to email us after this, um, but I will turn it over to questions now. Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And thanks to Jill and Felicia as well um, for sharing the information. Um, Felicia, that was really great to get um, that kind of inside information on what's going on in your school. Super helpful. Um, and yes, we are going to have some time for Q&A, but um, before we get to the Q&A part, I just want to thank Maui Learning for sponsoring today's webinar. And I also want to remind you that you'll receive a link to the recording and the slide deck, um, some resources from Maui Learning, and your certificate of attendance in an email tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that information. Um, but let's go ahead and take some questions. Um, thank you all for joining me back on screen. Um, and let's get started with some questions that were actually sent in um, when folks registered. And I think this is a good one really for um, probably all of you to chime in on. Um, how can educators more intentionally integrate SEL competencies into the non-academic aspects of the learning environment? I can take the first shot at that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, integrating SEL within um, the school, even in you know maybe lunch or recess where it's not necessarily academic, um, you can still try to incorporate those behaviors by doing things like modeling. Um, what you want students to do, right? Modeling the behavior you want to see. And then calling out examples of when you see positive interactions between students is another way to do that. Um, so noticing maybe when uh, kids sat with the new student at lunch and then either privately, you know, saying, hey, I, I really appreciate that you did that, that was great. Or um, if the situation calls for it, you know, publicly acknowledging um, those good skills. Naming feelings is something that can work for younger students, um, but also older students too, like teaching them to use I statements. And then um, asking students uh, to think about how they can use the skills they're learning in their own um, lives outside of school can also be really useful. So um, maybe they're in an argument with their sibling um, or they're feeling stressed about something, teaching them to use positive self-talk or teaching them to use those um, strategies they learn to help manage stress. Great, uh, Jeremy, you wanna tag on to that? Yeah, I think um, 
I think really being in, being intentional about including group work in your in your classrooms can be really helpful. Um, you probably already would have guessed that, but uh, I think anytime you can incorporate any any type of interaction among your students uh, is going to be helpful, uh, especially in the case of online learning. Uh, trying to find ways to to create small groups in the online environment is going to be especially important because they're clearly not going to get that um, as much as they normally would. Um, you know, in a, in a normal face-to-face -face situation. So anytime where you can have uh, students interacting together um, in, in any subject is gonna help with their social emotional skills, especially if, if you as a teacher have, have a chance to provide them with feedback on, on the nature of their interaction and, the, and, and what's positive about how they're interacting and but what, what are also some things that they can be doing to improve during those interactions. So I think being very intentional about Attempting to, to incorporate social interaction um, and a sense in each of the students that they belong in the classroom, whether it be virtual or in school, uh, is, is going to be extremely important. And Felicia, um, what, what are, have you seen at John Young? Well, I think also taking it outside of the classroom, I agree, be intentional throughout the day, but taking it outside of the classroom, the cross-age buddies where they're working with students in other classrooms, either older or younger students, and also getting to know the adults on campus. So you have that trusted adult. It may not just be the classroom teacher. Maybe you go and spend some time interviewing the principal, allowing the students to have some conversation with the assistant principal and other members of the leadership team at the school. So the students learn not only to build relationships within their own school, in their own classroom, they're learning to build relationships throughout the school. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And those different age groups and different types of people, um, that's great. Um, Jeremy, uh, we've had a request if um, we could just go back to the conclusion slide, which I think is the one that's right before this. Um, folks kind of want to noodle on that and take notes, but I will just give another reminder that you will get a copy of the slide deck um, and a link to the recording. So um, no need to scribble down too many notes. Uh, we'll share this with you. Um, Felicia, here's a question for you. Um, this is a, a big question, but <laughs> you can maybe give some <laughs> quick tips. Um, okay. Do you have any special strategies for SEL with non-English speakers? Right, that, that was a challenge of ours at the beginning as well, and that's where the Maui Learning came in for us. We wanted a way to help the non-English speakers be part of the same experience our students who were English speakers were having. So we did actually always include all of our non-English speakers in our morning meetings, in our closing meetings, as we did with all of our students, but we created different uh, graphics, picture representations for what we would be discussing or what we were trying to teach as far as the social skills, eye contact at the time, shaking hands, which we aren't doing that right now, um, some of those skills that we wanted our students to have. We also um, appreciated that the Maui Learning Program incorporated translations, Spanish and Arabic at the time were languages that we had a high population of students speaking. And that program allowed us to have those translations for our third, fourth, and fifth grade students so that they could learn the SEL in their language and in English. So they were getting both from that program. Yeah, that's a great SEL um, tool, but also a good language acquisition um, companion too. <laughs> so you're getting, you're getting both, that's wonderful. Um, all right, a question I think again for all of you. Um, how can meaningful connection be promoted among students um, and with teachers in a remote learning setting? And Jeremy, um, or I think Jeremy and Jill both gave some, some tips around that, um, but maybe we can expand on it. That's certainly the number one question that's um, coming in about how to do all of this virtually. Um, I guess I can go ahead and jump in first here. Um, so I guess, um, as Felicia mentioned, you really wanna provide a time and space that's dedicated to building relationships um, into the school day. And I think this is probably more important than ever, um, not only given the circumstances, but also if students are online, they're not seeing their peers necessarily in person. And so having that space um, where they can um, really talk to one another as, as friends um, is important. So um, it's probably not gonna happen organically without providing that structure. So you may wanna think about ways you can engage students that 
is maybe outside of the school day. Um, maybe optional activities like a virtual book or movie, movie club. Um, different ideas that can get kids engaged in talking to one another. And then, um, as Jeremy said, like facilitating smaller group work, I think is really important too, to help kids get to um, talk to one another and know one another. And uh, I'll chime in with one specific recommendation from, from the research. Um, a few years ago, some research came out that showed a simple intervention uh, something as simple as identifying things that students and teachers have in common uh, can lead to a number of positive outcomes. And that research was done by simply having um, teachers and students uh, list the things that they're interested in, but also kind of the, some of the things they value, and then sharing some of those common elements between students and teachers. And that had some um, very positive downstream consequences. So a, a very simple exercise where you you ask students and teachers, you know, what are you interested in? What do you, what are things that are important to you? And then sharing sharing those things um, helps create a, a special connection that that between teachers and students. But I think also it can easily occur between students and other students that wouldn't necessarily happen at least right away. Um, if you didn't take the few minutes to do that, um, and that can clearly easily be done online, um, maybe maybe even more easily done online with, depending on the technology you use, than in person. Yeah, that's a, a good point. I think, um, wow, well, we know there are downsides to not being in person. Um, sometimes you can actually broaden your yeah. circle and the connections that you can make um, using these technology platforms. Um, so that's great. Um, and Jill, I love the idea of virtual books and and movies. I yeah, I love watching a movie um, with and texting people about it and connecting in that way. So that's great. Felicia, anything you want to add on that front? All right. Well, our next question is for you. Um, so many of our educators um, are heading into a school year where they're going to have remote learners as well as in-person learners, that hybrid model um, going on. Um, and do you have any suggestions for managing and teaching um, in-person and remote learners at the same time? So we're just uh, beginning in that environment now. We began school August the 10th, so we've been in for a couple of weeks now. We do have uh, students that are now coming face to face and in a blended model where some of our students are at home, some are face to face. So we're learning as we go here. Um, as we always say our, right now, our teachers are building the plane as they're flying it. But in our hybrid classrooms, a few of the things that we are doing and experimenting with, the idea of all of the students, whether they're in the classroom or they're um, at home, they're all online in the web conferencing tool so that the students can see each other, not just the teacher. And they have the opportunity to go into breakout rooms and have discussions with the teacher monitoring them. Those breakout rooms are designed intentionally, mixing our face-to-face -face and our at home learners in the same breakout room. So they are all collaborating together and talking together. In addition, it may sound very simple, but the teacher moving the camera around throughout the day. So the student is not staring, the one who is at home is not staring at the same corner of the classroom all day long. But if I'm going to move over and do a small group, I'm going to move my computer with me over to the small group and we're going to learn together. If we're going over to the math center, Everybody, including the camera, is coming over to the math center to make those students at home feel like they're a part of that classroom. One other thing that was done that I think is very important is at the very beginning, they had a very open conversation as to why some students chose to stay home or their families chose to keep them at home and why some have chosen to come to school. So there would be respect and understanding for the beliefs on both side of, side of that, sides of that argument as to I feel safer at home or I feel perfectly safe at school with my mask on. So those discussions had to happen early on for that mutual understanding and respect for one another. Yeah, that's great. I love that suggestion of, of explaining why we're doing class in two different places, um, especially for the little ones that can be confusing as to what that's about. Um, so thanks for sharing that. 
Um, and let's see again, and maybe Jill, um, you can start us off on this one. I think probably everybody's got something to say on this, um, but what are some best practices that support both SEL and also provide for equitable opportunities for all students? Um, I, I guess I would suggest number one, um, getting to know students' families in the community that you live in, um, bringing them in um, as equal partners when possible because they, they know their students. And then um, I'm not an expert on this, but culturally responsive teaching is a way to um, use a framework to support both, you know, equitable opportunity as well as SEL. So that's a framework that people can use as they're thinking about how to best support um, all learners. And then I guess I, I would just um, promote professional development also um, so that teachers can kind of explore maybe any hidden biases they might have or um, best practices in terms of really teaching SEL skills and making sure that all learners are, are getting what they need. Great, Jeremy, anything to add, Felicia? Um, I'll add one thing that we didn't, not, we, we didn't really bring up yet that is as a possibility of something to do that, that may help with equity, but that may just be a general practice to think about. Um, in general right now is to um, start with data and if you do if you have access to a, a reliable and valid social emotional learning assessment it may be useful uh, to start your semester with an assessment so you know exactly where all of your students are at the beginning of the semester um, at the beginning of the semester in their social emotional skill development so that you know where to focus uh, your efforts and you know where where um, groups within your school's area of strengths are and, and their areas biggest areas areas of needs are um, and that may help um, help your teaching become more equitable but it also is just a good practice to start in general because we know you know at this this is an, an unusual time it will be helpful to get a good baseline uh, measure to see where your students are at yeah that's great uh, anything, Felicia? Okay. Um, and Jeremy, actually, if you could go back one more slide. Um, folks are wanting that URL. I think it's on the next one. Um, yeah, folks are wanting that URL for uh, the free lesson content and um, the blog. Um, you'll also find um, the research um, that we've been discussing, that Jeremy's been reviewing um, in that blog as well. But we'll be sending out um, links to, to access that specifically too. So. Um, again, keep an eye on your email tomorrow for that information. Um, and let's see, we'll take um, one more question, I think. And so any suggestions for parental management for those parents who have two or more kids at home that are attending you know, online classes? Um, so how managing space time, allowing for all those different people <laughs> to, to have access to internet and devices? I can jump in on that one. We obviously are dealing with that right now. Um, parents who have uh, multiple students at home learning 100% from home are often dealing with how do I balance, how do I support them all at the elementary. Older students obviously can work a little more independently. Um, we are recording some of our lessons so that parents will have the opportunity to go back and reteach with a student if necessary. We're also um, allowing our morning meetings to be recorded. So students sometimes have to alternate if they're being offered at the same time. I'll participate in mine today. You'll participate in yours tomorrow, but I can still watch and learn from my friends through the recording that was done the day before. Also giving parents suggested schedules to follow has been really helpful. We've sent a lot of parent material out as to how they might arrange the day, making sure the students also get some breaks from their online learning and are not trying to go the full eight hour day without any breaks in the day. Taking recess, in the hybrid model, they take recess when our face-to-face -face group takes recess. But if they're not in a hybrid model, that has to be um, planned in the day by the parents. So just communicating a lot with the parents and letting them know we understand I think we have to consider their social emotional learning as well and what they're going through at home. And we understand and we're here to work with you and we can be flexible as well. Yeah, I think grace and space is um, the, the key word <laughs> for, for all of us. 
uh, in, in school and beyond. So um, Jill and Jeremy, anything you want to add to that? Uh, nothing really to add, but I do have two at home learners. And so I can, um, I can relate to the, the idea of not stressing parents out too much. Um, <laughs> you know, not, not, um, not putting too much on them so that their children in turn become stressed. So I can, I, I can definitely relate to that. Yeah. And the communication piece, Felicia, as you said, just um, providing parents with all those resources, letting them know what's going on, letting them know what options are. Um, communication has always been important, obviously, with families, but um, now it's so much more critical. So um, great suggestions. So we are coming up to the end of our time together. Um, and this has just been, the hour has flown by. It's been wonderful. And we really appreciate Jeremy and Felicia and Jill being here with us today. Um, and we very much appreciate Maui Learning's sponsorship of um, this webinar, as well as the SEL Exchange coming up on October 15th. Again, registration will be open for that on September 14th, um, and we will include a link in the email that you get tomorrow um, so that you can sign up to get notified of when that registration is open, and you can also visit the website to learn a little bit more um, about the SEL Exchange Virtual Summit. Um, we're very excited about it and um, looking forward to lots of opportunities to, to share information about how to support our own SEL development, as Jeremy said, um, as well as all of our students and children, young people out there. Um, again, Maui will be sharing um, resources and links to this research um, in the email that we send tomorrow. We'll also be sharing the recording in the slide deck. Um, and when you get that email, if you scroll to the very bottom, you'll see a big blue button that says my certificate. And if you click on that, you'll be able to download your certificate of attendance for today's program. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we appreciate everyone's time, particularly during this very busy time of year. And again, we appreciate Maui, Jeremy, Felicia, and Jill for being with us today. Um, so have a great day, everyone. And we hope to see you back on a future webinar and of course at the SEL Exchange Virtual Summit.